All right. It is 3.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome, everyone, to the November 2017 installment of the Sustainability Leadership Presentation Series. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today, we have the University of Nebraska Lincoln Environmental Studies Program hosting um, this presentation. So a couple of housekeeping items. All attendees are in listen-only mode to prevent any background noises. Uh, but you are invited to ask questions, so you can do that in a couple of ways. Uh, one way is to put questions directly into the WebEx chat box. Um, and if you are in a live viewing room, you can give your questions to your room host, and then they will put them in the chat box. And lastly, you can ask questions through Twitter using hashtag SLPS Thursday. Um, so we're really excited to have Dr. Benjamin Boat presenting on a new garden ethic, cultivating deep science, compassion for an uncertain future. Um, Dr. Benjamin Boat has a PhD in English from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. His writing and photography have appeared in over 60 publications from journals and magazines to anthologies. Benjamin writes a native plant, to plant gardening column at house.com and speaks nationally on sustainable and wildlife landscapes. He owns Monarch Gardens LLC, a prairie garden design firm, and he lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. So I will pass it over to him. Um, and then we'll go through questions at the end of the presentation. So thanks. All right, all set to go. Thank you for that. Um, I'm me. We're just going to get going because we got to get going. So I will be looking at my screen for notes. I'll be trying to look at the camera too. I'll be trying to look at some of the audience here. I might even look at myself, so forgive me. So let's get into it. Uh, it was a couple of years ago. I was in my garden, just on my hands and knees where every good gardener should be. And uh, I heard this rustling behind me and turned around and I saw this butterfly flapping herself across the mulch path behind me. And you can see she's not had a, she's at the end of her life. You can see birds have been nipping at her wings. Um, so I carried her around and I helped her lay the last five eggs of her life on her host plant, um, which is Golden Alexander's. So you can see um, three of the caterpillars actually came out uh, from the eggs. So you can see like I think that second or third instar on the left and fifth last instar on the right before it's going to go off and pupate. So let's talk about, we're going to do, this is going to be a deep, deep talk today, or I hope it's a deep talk, very highly philosophical. So not so much how to, but why to, and what's at stake, and just getting us to think critically about our landscapes, especially our urban landscapes, and how they can help wildlife. So I will, there will be a lot of slides with words on them, but that's okay. You can, you know, take pictures, get tattoos of them, do whatever you want. So let's start with this quote. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals are collectively the land. The land as a community is the basic concept of ecology, but that land is to be loved and respected is an extension of ethics. The land ethic then reflects the existence of an ecological conscience and this in turn reflects a conviction of the individual responsibility for the health of the land. We can only, we can be ethical only in relation to something we can see, feel, understand, love, or otherwise have faith in. A land ethic implies respect for our fellow members and also respect for the community as such. So if you have not read Aldo Leopold's The Sand County Almanac, that's where this, this quote is from. And this is going to ground us for our entire conversation this afternoon on what I mean by land ethic and garden ethic. So there are basically three ways to look at a landscape, three perspectives. The first way is biocentrism, and that's an ethical point of view that all living things carry the same highest possible value on our planet. Pretty incredible radical thinking, I think. The second is ecocentrism, the ecosystem, living and non-living components matters above all else. And then the third is anthropocentrism, humans are valued above all else. And that's certainly the culture we live in right now, certainly in America, and certainly in most societies across the world. Which one do you ascribe to? So who are we gardening for when we put plants out in landscapes, whether that's at home or around churches and schools and businesses? We're probably gardening for hummingbird moths, gardening for spiders that capture honeybees and milkweed, for monarch butterflies, of course. They're big in the news all the time. We're gardening for marning doves and the really silly nests they make. They make nests that are like five twigs and they put their babies in there. It's just like, good luck, you know, stay in the nest. We're gardening for tree frogs on cone flowers, gardening for hummingbirds all the time. That's on our native blue sage. This was cool. Uh, my wife and I were packing to go see visit my parents for Christmas one year, and she called me back into the bedroom to look out of the out of the door onto the deck. A robin was sitting there drinking a melting snow off the corner of a garden bench. 
And that was pretty neat and everything, but all of a sudden a bluebird landed to waiting to take his turn, and then another bluebird landed waiting to take his turn to drink that melted snow. This is what we're gardening for. So we have to think about beyond aesthetics when we're designing landscapes because plants are not art. What we do with them, how we honor their life processes as part of creating ecological function, that is art. So I'm gonna show you a lot of pictures from my home landscape, but also pictures uh, from other people's landscapes, uh, professional landscapes mostly, but here's one of my front yard. Definitely rethinking pretty. Across the street is Mr. Moe's all the time, who mows three times a week. Well, he moved now, so I don't think they mow any more than new neighbors, but Mr. Moe's all the time did mow three times a week. This is the main back garden, the oldest part of my landscape. I live on a quarter acre, and I probably only have a couple hundred square feet of lawn left. But this is the oldest garden at, uh, it's about 10 years old now. That's what it looks like in May. So that's May, that's July, that's May. That's October-ish, at least a couple years ago it was. And winter can be beautiful, especially if you leave your plants up. Plants are meant to be left up. They're providing habitat for wildlife shelter and they're keeping the plants, they're helping snow come and insulate the plants, all good stuff. Plus it just looks better than just cutting it all down in fall and having a moonscape. So here's a video. There we go, it's running. I took a picture once a day for a year and a half. It's about a minute long. If you see a guy in a gray shirt, it is my ghost. So we're in October, November now. Snows are going to start coming. That was a nice snow, but that's not the biggest one. That's not the biggest one. That's a puny one. There's a big one. We haven't had a 12 inch snow in ages. I think that was 12 inches. So here we are spring. Everything is coming back up. Most things in my garden are herbaceous perennials, so they're coming up out of the ground new every year. And this is a drought year. So from June to August, we had about a half an inch of rain back in 2012, if you remember. There you go. This is usually the point when people clap. <laughs> we, we clapping. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about ecology then, because we're going to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper this afternoon. So there are two philosophies when it comes to looking at the environment. And the first is deep ecology. Um, it basically states that we need to revamp the human systems that deny cultural and biodiversity in nature, recognizing human culture as not the only or even the primary culture on this planet. It's basically saying there are other species or other organisms that have cultures as diverse, varied, and, and pretty cool as our own. Then we have shallow ecology. Uh, it promotes technological fixes to address environmental issues, often using the same methods as a consumptive industrial-based society that eroded nature. So you can think like wind turbine solar panels, really great, a lot better than using fossil fuels, but it's still, it's still continuing the culture we have that's extraction-based and says that humans are superior to other species and just continues giving us permission to do whatever we want. So the main difference between the bo both of them is that deep ecology regards all species as having essential wisdom to guide us forward, whereas shallow ecology primarily looks just to humans for understanding and direction. What we need to do is give up some degree of control in our gardens and our landscapes, and that's going to free us while bringing us into a new relationship with life. We don't have to be in control, and in fact, gardens often give us the illusion of control, which further divorces us from life. Existence is already incredibly ordered. Uh, you know, everything can be mapped with mathematical fractals, those, those algorithms. What can wilder landscapes teach our urban landscapes? What plants and designs can we use to practice biocentrism and deep ecology? So it all starts with what is a native plant? I'm a big native plant proponent. Some people call me a native plant purist. That's totally cool. Doug Ptolemy and Rick Dark in their book, The Living Landscape, say this is what a native plant is, a plant that has evolved in a given place over a period of time sufficient to develop complex and essential relationships with the physical environment and other organisms in a given ecological community. That evolution can take thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, millions of years, 
In very few cases does the evolution happen in a matter of decades, even though it certainly can, years too in some cases. But for me, a native plant is one that existed in the Americas before European colonization, which was a supercharged act of terraforming, just incredibly fast, incredibly thorough. We're still doing a great job of it right now. What are the benefits of native plants? Native plants provide 15 to 35 times the caterpillar biomass versus exotics. So caterpillars, um, they're the larval stage of insects that are eating the leaves, right? 96% of songbirds feed insects to their young. Native bees visit native plants four times more. Native plants support 4,000 native bee species that have longer flight times than honeybees and provide specific pollination like buzz, which will increase fruit yield, quality, and shelf life. So if you're into strawberries, blueberries, squash, almonds, you're going to want to have as many different bees pollinating those food crops as you possibly can. Losing one specialist native bee species is going to send entire pollinator systems out of whack as other specialists are then, of course, to become generalists. So they sort of have to pick up the slack of the missing specialist bee species. So if we have more native plants in general, that's going to give us more native pollinators and it's going to give us more seed production and hopefully adaptable plants in the face of climate change. Don't invite me to parties. I will spew off stats like this. In fact, I won't even come because I'm an introvert, so it really doesn't matter. The kids today do see 35% fewer butterflies than their parents did 40 years ago. So what it comes down to is that native plants are the tip of a much, much larger iceberg and represent more than aesthetic value. And maybe that's the problem too, right? Talking about gardens is not just a refuge from trouble, but the very heart of trouble a reflection of larger issues we can change is uncomfortable and it should be uncomfortable. We don't want our gardens to be statements for anything but personal pleasure. We don't want our gardens to be influenced by the world out there. Gardens are supposed to be safe places away from conflict or critical thought. For example, for example, we're still heavily influenced by monastic cloister gardens that say everything out there is dangerous, everything in here is safe. Our gardens are not in their little worlds though. Gardens and managed landscapes are not just for us, and to assume they are is racism toward other species. That's a beautiful moth from like Mars or something. You can tell because of the eyes. Wink, wink. One myth of a garden is that it rights systemic cultural wrongs, such as human supremacy or capitalism or, defore or deforestation, and that we help the environment or get in touch with nature and inherently practice sustainability simply by using plants. Another myth of the garden is that any garden, any composition of plants uh, is better than no garden at all. That it doesn't really matter if you use a large proportion of native plants as long as the plants you use are fitted to the soil, light, and climatic conditions. That's wonderful native purple prairie clover, by the way. Great for uh, some specialist bees in early summer. And this is a view of, of, you know this view maybe, Lincoln, Nebraska, right? That's where the Huskers lose their football games on the far left. I'm a gopher fan, so it pleases me immensely. So anyway, to get serious, again, we are colonizers. Uh, and as such, we replace the culture of the oppressed with the culture of the oppressor, and that's us. Whether that's through our plant, plant choices or in how we arrange those plants and landscapes. The garden can be a way to bridge our seemingly disparate cultures, human and animal, human and plant. But it's also often a way to exercise domination over others in the name of one's own joy, happiness, and sense of personal freedom. Now, if this control is primarily what a garden is, then perhaps gardens will, in the end, always fail to move us into a better relation with other species and ecosystems. Now, why aren't those acreages near my house, all on prairie anyway? People mowing every week, three acres at a time. Mind blowing. So here's a common native plant critique. Uh, it's by a review of Thomas Rainier and Claudia West's wonderful book that everybody should be planting in the post-wild world. The reviewer, Adrian Higgins, says this of their book. They reject the popular approach of using indigenous plants exclusively to redeem wilderness because such a place no longer exists. So in other words, using a majority of native plants, particularly in the context of highly altered places like cities and industrial agriculture, will not recreate, stabilize, or be a significant ecological benefit because the historical wildness or ecosystem no longer exists. Or i.e., we can never go back, but of course we can never go back. Those systems are gone. Native plant garden design is not about redeeming wilderness, though, but reviving it. 
While wilderness may not exist in the ecologically pristine way we culturally idealize in art and film, books and all that stuff, the ecological interactions, and especially the species that depend on wildness and native plants, are still very much here and critically important to our future, even if the original native landscape is gone forever. And that a great shot down my street of that monarch butterfly and aromatic aster tells you something. So often a, often a line of argument goes that being a native plant purist, which I mentioned before, makes the perfect the enemy of the good. The reasoning goes that having a 100% or even 75% native plant landscape is not only functionally unrealistic, but it's also simultaneously unfair to humans because it's limiting, constrictive, and otherwise undemocratic. In other words, a native plant garden reduces human freedom and maybe isn't as necessary for supporting animal biodiversity. But you know what? None of these tenets are true unless we're gardening for just one species. If, on the other hand, our intent is to garden for the community, then native plants are not limiting, but in fact are life-giving and freedom-giving uh, to countless seen and unseen fauna above and below the soil line. So basically, what I'm saying is our reach has to always exceed our grasp. Reach for 100% native plant landscapes. And if you get to 75%, great. But if you only reach for 50%, you probably only end up at 25%. So for me, I guess what I'm saying is a native plant conversation is not one of resistance or a hardline fundamentalist puritanical stance. Instead, the conversation is about stoking the embers of connectivity to the natural world, our home places, where we live, or reimagining and recreating a human culture that values other cultures, plant and animal, as much as its own. So true equality, biocentrism. Such empathy and compassion does not come easily to us, even among our own species. Look at that lovely caterpillar on the left there. Her red, pop, red spotted purple caterpillar designed to look like bird poop. Maybe not always attractive to us, but man, it's ingenious. And wasps are good because they're beneficial predators. That's one on the right. Our plants do matter. They matter in so many more contexts than just what they're doing for wildlife directly. We have temperature zones shifting north at 3.8 feet per day. We're losing 30,000 to 140,000 species each year. We have over 19,000 threatened species, 3,900 that are critically endangered, 5,700 that are endangered, 10,000 that are vulnerable. I mean, it's just crazy, right? In the face of a quickly altering world, our garden plants really do matter more than ever. So let's talk a little bit about bees before we go even deeper. Our 4,000 species of native bees are going to be especially at risk in climate change, particularly larger bees like bumblebees who evolved in a cooler climate and those with shorter flight times that coincide with changing bloom cycles. Within those blooms is highly nutritious pollen, which bees use to feed their young. So nectar is just a fuel to flying around, but the pollen is what is actually feeding their young. One of the most beneficial groups of plants for bees and other pollinators is goldenrod, solid dago, which from 1842 to 2014 has seen a reduction in pollen protein content at 30%. Such loss is due to elevated levels of CO2 in the atmosphere and will not only affect bee health, but also bee size, which in turn affects a bee's ability to successfully forage. As plants produce more carbohydrates in response to increased carbon in the air, essential nutrients like zinc, iron, and vitamin A become diluted, making plants less nutritious for animals, uh, for humans and insects alike. So we're all going to feel this nutrition gap. So to, adapt, to adapt to climate change, species are going to need habitat corridors and islands and refuge. Our smallest native bees have flight ranges of less than three blocks before they need to refuel. You know, those tiny, tiny bees, like if you, if you have grow golden alexanders in your landscape in spring, you see lots of tiny little carpenter bees on there. You can hardly see them like gnats or something. These guys can't go more than three blocks without refueling. We've lost one-tenth of global wilderness in the last 20 years, and 50% of species face extinction by 2100. We may lose 30% of all global plant species by 2050. I told you not to invite me to parties, right? Okay, I'm just going to tell you this stuff. I'm a downer. But we can do something about it, and that's the point of this talk today. Where I'm from and where a lot of you are from is the Great Plains. This is the original extent of the grasslands. There are various different maps. This is one, so somewhat accurate, of course. So dark green, good, that's, that's what it was. Dark green now, that's what it is. Dark green is fairly intact grassland habitat still. Everything else is stuff that's been radically converted and altered. 
tallgrass prairie is the most altered, least conserved ecosystem on the entire planet. There's less than 2% of it left. Some stats have it at less than 1% left. But we have 5,000 native plant species native to the Great Plains. Tons of life are in this habitat, in this wilderness. That's all around us still even. Grassland nesting birds are the fastest declining group in North America. 50% of North America's 650 bird species will be severely, severely affected by climate change this century. 230 are already endangered or at risk. So basically to respect life, you have to respect, respect the place it comes from, the culture of its existence, and let it develop its culture of place. A prairie's culture is one we barely understand, a complex structure formed over countless generations where mutualism and exclusion create healthy and resilient ecosystems above and below the soil line. In many human cultures, a prairie culture, the prairie ecosystem itself, uh, would seem destructive and undemocratic. A prairie would be harsh and unrealistic, unfair and totalitarian. And maybe that's why we've eradicated so much of it in America. It just seems so unlike us. But we're making a difference in some areas, right? Uh, we, we can do something about our roadside uh, management and create refuges. New Mexico has, is managing 7,500 miles of state roads for wildlife. So they're basically putting it into native grasses and native flowers. And they're capturing carbon at rates of 35 to 30, 350%. So cars driving by spewing out all that toxic stuff is being absorbed by the grasses and the plants right off the edge of the road. Pretty cool. Greenery and National Park Wildlife Refuge and other public land roads capture 7 million metric tons of CO2 annually, which is equal to 5 million cars. I want to see a less, less of this. We are mowing all the time and we don't need to be mowing all the time. It's insane. We have large spaces that can be doing a lot, a lot more uh, good ecologically, environmentally. Take airports. Dayton, Dayton International Airport has turned 600 acres into prairie. It's going to slash maintenance costs, sequester 66 tons of carbon, provide habitat for bird species like meadowlarks and bobolinks that need expansive breeding areas. It's also going to mitigate large bird strikes uh, because those birds are not going to want to leave the cover of the grasses. They're going to feel safe there and not going to want to take off. So we need to find a prairie and hug the corn out of it, at least some corn. Maybe we can hug our state capital and get some of the lawn out in there. Why is it one side of the state capital in, in, in Prairie or something like that? It was originally designed to, to have that. Instead, it's got lawn. The trees are great. Let's have a savanna, though. Let's get the prairie in there. Let's celebrate what Nebraska is, what our history is. This is part of my front yard. Um, it's just probably, it's probably less than 1,000 square feet. So turned it into some, in, into some designed meadow beds. There's a six foot long path going up the middle to show it. There's a little bit of design intent. There's a little bit of purpose and that lawn connects it to the lawn hell strip and all the rest of the lawn going along the curve of our street. Plants are usually blooming in clumps and masses too to give it a little bit of sense of organization as well. Here's a view in June, looking to the west at sunset. Also did something radical to the backyard. Uh, I got tired of mowing it. It was like 3,000 square feet. And, you know, it must have taken me half an hour, way too much mowing time. So I said enough with that. So I scalped it two falls ago, raked up as much thatch as I possibly could, seeded it with um, some seed I bought and some seed I collected on my own, put in about 150 flower plugs. And this is what it looked like in, uh, I think it was June or early July this year. So it's really growing up in two years. The native grasses, the blue stem, the cytos grandma, are just doing a number on the tall fescue lawn. It, that, that fescue lawn is going away, and I didn't have to spray it or till it up or anything. Here's a view of a couple weeks ago of the backyard in full fall color. Pretty cool, right? Cool. Cool. All cool. right. We got one guy saying cool. <laughs> so here we go. We're going to the ultimate deep level now. Native plants are a moral and ethical choice. You can pick your word if you want to. I know one of those words can tend to be more controversial than the other. So let's talk about psychology, psych 101, ethical amnesia. When we act unethically, we tend to remember those actions less clearly. And that's a phenomenon based on the fact that we feel uncomfortable remembering ourselves acting in ways we shouldn't. And that's what ethical amnesia is. Further, it's driven by the desire to lower one's distress that comes from acting unethically and to maintain a positive self-image as a moral individual. In general, people limit the retrieval of memories that threaten their moral self-concept. 
This is one reason why scientific consensus is so often rejected, because the new reality threatens our belief systems. And when more evidence or fact is presented, a backfire effect happens. People stand their ground even more staunchly to preserve their worldview. This is totally natural. It's not, not, a, not a dark criticism. I just want to point it out. We've got to go through this and understand how we think, how we act as humans. We're also avoiding grief. Uh, when we look at environmental issues, when we consider should native plants be in gardens, there are five stages of grief, denial, numbness, shock, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. They can go in any order. It doesn't have to be this order, but that's the one that makes sense to me. We avoid grief when we don't address climate change or when we don't critically engage with what our gardens are doing and what they should mean in light of climate change and mass extinction. Here's a wonderful book by Mary Pfeiffer, The Green Boat. If you haven't read it, it's fantastic. It's about the psychology of, of climate change and environmental issues. So I at least have one of her quotes. I might have more. She says this, we humans are programmed to respond to threats by fleeing or fighting. Our global storm will not let us do either. Our problems feel too big to fight, and there is no place we can flee to. So we feel paralyzed. We are in a crisis that is too scary to confront and too important to ignore. Willful ignorance occurs when it feels wrong to acknowledge and wrong not to acknowledge a situation. This leads to crazy-making attempts to balance precarity between awareness and denial. So our one universal reality is that avoiding our emotions or minimizing them will prolong grief. And this is something I see in the garden world quite clearly. We sidestep grief when we avoid confronting how gardens collectively and meaningfully impact the environment. We'll defend our plant and design, design choices to the last, daffodil, forsythia, hosta, wood mulch galore. We will do anything we can to avoid looking more deeply and authentically at our culture so we don't have to face the loss, the grief, and the effort to change or be agents of change in a world crying out for compassion on a profound new level. Now, isn't that awesome green roof fantastic? It's just fantastic. It's in Lincoln. We need more. Let's do it. Other ways we avoid grief, we, can, we deny reality, reality entirely. We accept some aspect, aspect of reality, but deny others. We minimize or normalize. You see that a lot right now in politics, but I'll stay away from that. I'm done with it. We overemphasize our lack of power. We deny emotional investment. We feign empathy. We kill the messenger. Hey, native plant guy, you're just crazy. I'm going to go eat a Snickers. One coping mechanism when we're trying to overcome grief and deal with environmental issues like climate change and native plants is the idea of novel ecosystems, which helps us avoid that grief, as well as avoiding the complications of ethical insight. The novel ecosystems give us a way to ex keep exercising our privilege over other species. So what is a novel ecosystem? It's on the bottom, but don't get ahead of me. There are three basic landscape levels. The first is historical. That's wild ecosystems that show no or little change. So they're a lot like they were hundreds of years ago, maybe thousands of years ago. Those really don't exist anymore. Not with CO2 in every part of the atmosphere and ocean anymore. Then we have hybrid landscapes. They're mostly wild. They're ecosystems which show reversible changes. And then finally, we have novel ecosystems. They show irreversible changes with a radical difference from historical ecosystem structure, composition, and function, and an ongoing self-organization that's either human-created or self-created. Sounds a lot like a garden, right? So here's Doug Ptolemy and Rick Dark again from their book. 85% of the Earth's ecosystems are now novel, containing species with no prior history of interaction and no evolutionary relationship. Such ecosystems are built, at least in part, from non-relational biodiversity. The linguist could successfully argue that without functional interactions, such collections of organisms, organisms do not constitute an ecosystem at all. So when you're walking around landscapes in your city, are those actually functional ecosystems? Because we can have them in urban areas. The wildlife is still here. Speaking of novelty, this plant creates a lot of hubbub, right? What is it? You guys know? Butterfly bush. It attracts only a few charismatic, generalist, long-term insects who can access the nectar. No North American insect has co-evolved with the pollen or the leaves, and the plant invades Appalachian roads, brick walls in England, and now some Midwestern grasslands. Yet people plant it in the belief it helps butterflies. And when it's suggested it might actually hurt butterflies because it hurts the ecosystem, it feels like a condemnation or erasure of personal values. I mean, it's called butterfly bush, right? It must be good. 
but instead realizing the garden carries good and bad consequences is liberating and it can be empowering too. We are practicing critical thinking where we don't take plants or garden design at face value. A butterfly bush doesn't help us deal with environmental grief. Instead, it helps us avoid grief by privileging a few adult butterflies over ecosystem function and by privileging us, what we want in the landscape, saying what we want matters most. Here's Ptolemy and Dorothy again. Boy, I'm quoting them a lot. But look at the awesome milkweed bugs on the, on the right. Just focus on them. The relationship between landscaping practices and the production of vital ecosystem services has created ethical issues never ever before faced by gardeners. Because the resources and services that support all humans come from functional relationships and function starts with plants, the planting and management choices we make at home impact our neighbors and indeed our greater society as a whole. In essence, the relationship between plants and ecosystem function makes the ecological functionality in our landscapes a public resource just like a reservoir, a river, and a national park. Unfortunately, this new reality is in direct conflict with Western culture's tradition of private land ownership. That's worth getting tattooed, right? Too many words. We just needed a cat picture right now. I just felt it coming. That's my cat out in my back now, though. All right. I missed one. I've only been gone from home 90 minutes. All right. We need contact with nature, with daily wildness, to stoke positive feelings toward others. And those others are birds, butterflies, bees, wasps, spiders, moles, whatever. When we have those positive experiences, a learning mechanism is triggered in our brains, and that leads to empathy. This, this, this is psychology. A study that's out there is proven. And it only takes a very few positive engagements to make strong leads in empathy-based thinking. So go out there and touch those spiders, right? Get that empathy going. Empathy starts with seeing and experiencing the world through another's circumstances, beliefs, and life experiences. Now, compassion, on the other hand, is actually feeling, dealing with, accepting, and then taking action based on that other's existence. That's a much bigger leap than just empathy. The whole idea of compassion is based on a keen awareness of the interdependence of all these living beings, which are all part of one another and all involved in one another. Read from Thomas Merton, right? Merton's compassion is an ethical and even a moral one, a selfless and actionable compassion that confronts, accepts, and transforms our agonies, griefs, and doubts into passionate reconciliation. Such an act takes a great amount of courage and love. Caring for others is a highly evolved way of caring for the self, and this is how our landscapes need to change. Our gardens are places of social justice for all species. Social justice for humans, too. Students with views of complex nature out of classroom windows, and by complex nature, I don't mean lawn, a tree, and a parking lot. I mean shrubs and lots of trees and lots of flowers and lots of tall grasses. Their test scores improve. They're, they're, they're more creative. They're able to focus, better able to work in groups as a result. Trees around schools and hospitals decrease airborne particulate matter, making the air cleaner and healthier and not stunting those young growing brains that need clean air. Trees help cool the environment, of course. We know this in urban areas. When you combine that with shrubs and, and, and grasses and flowers underneath, you have super, super powers going on. A two-degree rise in global temps is going to see a 50% rise in violence by 2050. That's, that's the projection. We'll see if it happens. So urban areas with cultivated vegetation see significant drops in petty and violent crime, from mowed green spaces to community vegetable gardens to wilder landscapes with fences and walking paths. Here's an example of urban wildness here in Lincoln. Messy, not messy, it's okay, isn't it? It's a lot better than looking at the street. Union Plaza, some nice drifts of native plants and others going through there. Here's, a, here's Mill River Park in Stamford, Connecticut. What I think is interesting about this is it very much does look wild even though it's been purposely planted. But, but what's even more appealing I think is that um, there's, there's human consideration here. You can see that human consideration in a little bit of mowed strip on the edge of the sidewalk over there. And none of the plants about 10, 20 feet deep are any higher than about your waist. So nothing's going to come out and grab you, right? No sunflower is going to come attack you. Here's a little meadow that was sown in the Hidden Creek Savannah in Forest Park in St. Louis, Missouri. Just a little area left to be a little bit wilder. Looks okay and has a good, good, good purpose. Now here's George W. Bush Presidential Center in Dallas, Texas. I normally wouldn't be pimping George W. Bush, but 
fantastic landscape here. They got about 20 acres, all native plants to Texas. Uh, almost all the rain is being captured from the roof and the parking lot and everything and being filtered down into the cistern and they use that to water the small lawn areas they have. When everything's weeded, I found this interesting. They actually clip everything. There's no spraying. So I thought that was that's super environmentally conscious, right? Very hands-on. And here's just something small you can do. Mount Tabor Middle School in Portland, Oregon. This is cleaning the runoff from uh, from the uh, parking lot. But it's also it's also pretty and it's also functional, not just for humans, but for wildlife at the same time. We share the space together. You can have spaces that are even a little bit more designed or wild. It, it, you know, I don't know what you think of this picture, if it's wild, if it's messy, or if it looks put together. I think it looks put together because plants are massed, they're in drifts a little bit, and the heights are all quite similar. So it looks like a garden, but it's meant to be wilder. Uh, here's Scott's garden from up in Oregon. Lives in a very urban area, small lot, um, but done a lot. That's the hell strip on the left. That's a deceased cat in the middle on the sidewalk. Let's have a moment of silence. Okay, we're done. And then his small front yard on the right, but you can do a lot in a small lot. This is a backyard. It's just about 10, 15 foot deep, just a long strip of native plants. And most of it's clumped, drifts sort of thing. Uh, that person actually has had fox, uh, young foxes, uh, hanging out in their backyard for a couple of months, which is really cool, I think. Even though foxes are common, right? So what do we do? We have to make these kind of landscapes public. We have to engage the public so that they're accepting of them a little bit more because they're different. Wilder landscapes function a little bit differently. Pollinators are big in the news. And so the iron is hot right now. And birds are a primary species that folks recognize and equate with nature. And of course, birds require diverse habitats from trees to shrubs to meadows. And one chickadee nestling needs 400 insects per day for two weeks while it's growing up. So mom and, mom and pop are going out there trying to find caterpillars and adult insects and butterflies and spiders and whatnot. And a lot of these insects need their host plants to reproduce. We can use signs in public landscapes as well. I think these are really cool core 10 signs at Longwood. Longwood Gardens, their meadow out in Pennsylvania just telling people just a little bit real quick what the purpose of this landscape is, what it's doing, and that, you know, it's there for a reason. It's there for all of us together. When designing urban spaces, we need a collaborative effort as well. It can't just be architects and managers, but it's also got to include ecologists, biologists, horticulturists, permaculturists, a bunch of other ists. We must also get the community involved in the planning process and management, making them invested, seeing the space as anything but a one-off experience. It's not just something you walk to on the weekend. It is an integral part of your community and, and, and your health, your very physical health and your mental health. So what I'm saying is gardens can save the world by saving us. They can bring us back into contact with diversity. Gardens in our back and front yards. Gardens along urban streets, gardens in suburban parks, gardens surrounding schools and churches and corporate headquarters, gardens buzzing and humming and rustling, forming connected highways of mammals and birds and pollinators and microbes, gardens that heal our broken bonds to nature and to one another. Gardens as activism as surely as any art form and as surely as any mercy we might bestow on one another in times of sorrow. Again, who are we gardening for? gardening for queen butterflies who eventually occasionally come up this far north. They're more Oklahoma and Texas natives. We're gardening for the queen butterflies who are just barely escaping the clutches of a, a Chinese mantis over there. They're gardening for yellow shafted flickers. They're gardening for banded spiders, these wonderful orb weavers. I had eight in my backyard meadow this year. It's the most I've ever had in my landscape at one time, period, over 10 years. They're gardening for bees that kiss ants on past flower. We are gardening for dragonflies perched atop liatris buds. They're gardening for tussock moths who also use milkweed as a host plant. I've shown you milkweed bugs. Of course, monarchs use milkweed and tussock moths use milkweed. We're gardening for native bees and you can see evidence of carpenter bee there on the left who is carving out a stem in spring so they can put their eggs in there. This is why you want to leave your stems 12, 18, even 24 inches tall in the spring. Don't cut them flat down to the ground. This is home for bees. 
Um, I took some stems of Joe pie weed, cut them six inches long, put them up on the fence horizontally, and you can see there on the right, a mama bee in November, October, whenever froze to death, protect, protecting her eggs that are behind her from predators. Way more devoted as a parent than I would ever be, I gotta tell you. We're also gardening for bees that give us attitude. We're just trying to take their picture, trying to make them look good. We're gardening for fleas that flies that reflect us in their butt. So we all have to shift the paradigm. You all have to shift the paradigm. Teach, poke, prod, lead, and inspire. Landscapers, designers, and nurseries can no longer afford not to be sources of profound education and community environmental activism. And the same thing goes for every homeowner, uh, for every person who owns a building. We've got to rethink what pretty is and for whom it is pretty. Look at how many species just our native rattlesnake master supports. That's a lot. This is one plant. So here we go. I'm at the end. What is a new garden ethic? It's this. Your garden is a protest. It is a place of defiant compassion. That space is one that helps sustain wildlife and ecosystem function while providing an aesthetic response that moves you. For you, beauty isn't pedal deep. It goes down into the soil, further down into the aquifer, and back up into the air and for miles around on the backs and legs of insects. Now, you don't have to see soil microbes in action or birds eating seeds, butterflies laying eggs, or ants farming aphids. Just knowing it's possible in your garden thrills you. It's like faith, and it frees you to live life more authentically. Your garden is a protest for all the ways in which we deny our life by denying other lives. Plant some natives and be defiantly compassionate. That's my last beautiful slide. I think of my actress Aspera, rough blazing star gone to see. This just... My favorite season is upon me, and I had to put a favorite season picture up there. I just love autumn and all the seed heads and all the death and decay. It's beautiful. I'm a dark person. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you. A couple of clapping. All right. Any questions in this room? What was your neighbor's response and reaction to your look, your creation? What was my neighbor's response to my front yard creation, my front yard landscape, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, the whole reason that landscape started uh, was because we got a complaint from a neighbor through Lancaster County Weed Control. Lawn was probably eight inches long, maybe 10 inches in some place, especially near the edges where my neighbors water a lot so it comes over and helps my grass grow. Got a couple of dandelions. So for the whole summer, and, you know, my wife and I were thinking, should we pull up the lawn? Should we put it in the garden? Should we do it? Should we do it? And finally, at the end of the summer, we did it. I've had no complaints um, in the two or three years that it's been there. I think it's three years this fall that it's been there. Um, I used to have a sign out there explaining what the landscape was doing, what the purpose was. I don't know if that helped in the early stages. I don't know if it helped that there's a lawn, six foot wide lawn path going up the middle. Maybe people do think I'm crazy, but I don't know. It is, it is great. It's cool. I think it's rare. Uh, we live in an HOA, but it's not a very organized HOA, so... Nobody from up top coming down on me. But, you know, there are other tools you can use if you want to have a landscape like that in the front. You can do sculptures and benches to show that there's some more human intent in there. You could have a fire pit or large sitting area or, or just or just even have deeper foundation beds around your house that are maybe eight feet deep instead of the traditional three feet or six inches. You know, give a little bit more habitat. Any other questions from the big audience? Have you noticed the increase of uh, Wildlife, insects, or nature? I, w I wish I could say yes. Oh, yes. Have I noticed, thank you, have I noticed an increase in wildlife, and especially insects, in the landscape? And I wish I could say yes. Um, I think, you know, we are seeing fewer and fewer insects in general. Um, when I first started gardening here in Lincoln 10 years ago, as I added more garden areas and as I added more, more native plants, I can unequivocally say, yes, I was seeing more insects, absolutely. The last two or three years, even as I've doubled the size of my garden bed, I can't say I've noticed an appreciable difference. And there was just a uh, recently study published out of Germany in their wildlife areas, 75% of insects have gone missing. And those are in wildlife uh, areas, refuges, where insects should be safe. So what's happening in urban areas? What's happening around agricultural fields? Was it 5% that's left or something? I don't know. It's scary to think about. 
we can we can change this though. We can't. I really do believe we can. But we are running out of time. Are we good here? We're good here with questions. So if there's any online or thoughts. Okay, we've had a couple. Um, so one is if we need to plan urban gardens for wildness to plant specific species, are we not still controlling nature? If we let natural plant selection take place, will the landscape be more resilient than if we select the plants or would it take too long in time to achieve wildness in a highly disturbed urban area? Well, pollinators fly around, right? They have wings. So it's not like we're guarding for prairie dogs in urban areas. That would be a totally different case. Native plants are important. We need to be using native plants, period. Those are the lar that's the larval food of insects. So we need to be chasing those plants. We have tons of native plants that are suitable for the urban landscape. And yes, we're purposely putting them back in the landscape. That's called reviving the environment, right? We cannot recreate prairie in urban areas. It's not going to happen. There are all kinds of stresses and, of course, Look, it's just, it's just not going to be the same as it was once it's gone. But we are, we're talking about reviving here. We're talking about helping the health, especially the, especially the creatures that are moving through. We need islands of refuge. We need corridors of refuge for species to move. And they do move through the urban. In fact, they might be more in the urban. 70% 70, 70 of us are going to live in urban areas by the end of the century. So what contact are we going to have with wellness? What empathy, what compassion, what respect are we going to develop? If we don't have the plants in the landscapes that wildlife really are using as they come through our urban corridors, that would be my answer. Thank you. Okay, another one is: Would you have been comfortable doing this in your backyard if you didn't have a privacy fence? Absolutely. I just put up some shrubs. The shrub privacy fence. Yeah, shrub privacy fence. I, I, I'm lucky too that I don't have neighbors with the big dogs or kids throwing footballs or something because then I have to use shrubs with very big thorns, right? <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, have you encountered cities that are anti-natural plants or I know you mentioned um, like you're in an HOA. Have you experienced, like have you heard of other people having issues with that? Have I heard of other people having issues with having a slightly wilder front yard, you mean? Yes. Well, of course, it happens all the time. It, it's it's happened here. I know I know several people. Um, Twenty years ago, ten years ago, I'm uh, sure even now. You know, there's a big difference between just letting your landscape go or throwing a bag of prairie seed out versus trying to design it and manage it in a way that it doesn't just go totally crazy, right? And that means choosing the right plants, putting them in the right place. So there is, of course, always going to be an artifice to it, especially in a highly urban, altered environment. All right. Um, and then what would you consider to be the top three plants for Nebraska that look good, but also benefit a wide variety of insects and animals? Man, that's a hard question. Just three? Not 300. <laughs> No, I think asters, look, I'll, I'll just do like families and species or something like that, and I'll cheat a little bit. Our, our asters are, I think, incredibly important. Um, that, would, that would certainly be at the top of my list. There, one, one through three is asters. <laughs> um, just the different colors. Yeah, and gold, I think gold round too. You know, our, our, our pollinator uh, numbers really get their largest in August and September. So I'm always consciously thinking, how can I make uh, landscapes do the maximum support when the maximum number of, of insects are flying around and doing their business. So that would be a bunch of different aster species. We have asters that bloom in August, late August, different ones that bloom in early September, some that bloom late September, early October. So to have all those and spread them out along with goldenrods, sunflowers are incredibly, incredibly important. Um, some of them can be a little aggressive though, so you got to be careful with that. Okay, great. So um, if anybody has any more virtual ones, you can type those in. Otherwise, if anybody has more in-person ones, we can go back. Yes, to we have an in-person question. What um, alternative to traditional uh, lawn grass is to Okay, what what are some uh, alternatives to lawn grasses? Uh, people want to start making a difference. So you still want the lawn look. Right, is that what you're saying? 
No. If, if, the, if a homeowner wants to start making a difference, and the first thing they do is start making the building the trash alternative, more drought friendly, more uh, native, more appropriate for the landscape. Okay, plants that are appropriate for landscape. Yeah, picking plants that are appropriate for landscape is the first step, of course. That means research. So pollinator partnership, Xerxes Society, uh, Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. We've got lots of wonderful, wild ones is a, is a great resource. Just, I think even just planting one aster and sitting out there on your bum next to the aster or a foot away or something, watching what's visiting is gonna be a powerful experience for you. If we can make, again, our foundation beds around our houses and businesses are so thin and so sparse, you've got You've got a, a, a spirea or butterfly bush or hosta or God forbid a, a Carl Forster feather reed grass. You've got them three feet, four feet apart and they're, and they're smothered in six inches of mulch as all the plants are lined up like soldiers or a firing squad or something. You have to think about layers, right? When you walk out in nature, you don't see mulch. You don't see plants neatly arranged three, four feet apart from each other. So what, 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 what's a ground layer? Um, sedges are a great ground layer, great ground cover that can replace mulch. I mean, so that's like your first foot, right? Then you go higher up, you might be thinking cone flowers or something like that, just something that's mid-level, two or three feet tall, or Alice Lake Master, which can get four feet tall, depending on how rich the soil is or what the soil moisture is like. And then you can get to taller perennials and small shrubs and small trees and big trees. You want to create these layers because these layers are creating edge habitat for wildlife. The more diversity in, in the layers that you have, the more wildlife support you're going to have. And of course, not using pesticides and, and, and fertilizers and stuff like that is really important. But if you're matching the plants to the site, you've done your soil test, you've looked at drainage, you look at sunlight, and you're matching the plants to the site, you will have less management and less maintenance over time. So that's a plus. But it does take a lot of initial thinking, a lot of forethought, a lot of forethought and planning to do it right so it looks good as long as it possibly can. Yeah, another question here. Yeah. Do you have to, uh, can I perch your lawn or I perch, you know, like burn it or just come to the ground out, totally start over? Can you make a comment on that? Yeah, so basically, how do you get rid of the old lawn to establish the new, new garden bed? Did you want to say something or you just want me to repeat the question? Yeah, okay, that's fine. So, all right, yeah, there are multiple ways to do it. I've done it several different ways. I've used Roundup, glyphosate. Um, I've used a tiller. I don't like tilling anymore because it's really destroying whatever soil life is in that soil and any soil structure that might have developed, especially on, on in older landscapes um, where that soil has settled and the layers have started to build up and the organic matter has started to build up. Um, but Roundup, especially something like the Roundup 3 formulation, it doesn't last very long. It's just targeting the leaves and doesn't really stay in the soil very long. You can do that. You can even go, I mean, my backyard now, it, it's, I did a lot of seeding, but I did a lot of plant plugging. So there's three and five plants here. There's three and five plants here. I put taller ones in the middle or on the edges. So as the flowers, as the forbs develop and grow, there will be an inherent design that looks more traditionally garden-like. But you could do what I did and just scalp it, scalp the lawn, get rid of the thatch. I think it's important that you stress that lawn first. Don't water it for a year. Let some patches develop. Um, I was lucky in my backyard because, hey, I didn't water for years. And there's a little bit of a slope, so all the water on that clay soil just went whoosh off down, so some bare spots were growing. But I've been really impressed at how aggressive some of those native grasses have been. And that's helped establish a good ground layer for me to work with as I continue to design that backyard meadow. That was a long response, wasn't it? That was good. It's good. Uh, how do you maintain seedless neighbors if you have aggressive species in your property? Oh, how do you maintain the species if you have aggressive, how do you maintain the peace with neighbors if you have aggressive species on your property? Well, try not to have aggressive species. That, that's where the research comes in. I'm learning a lesson a little bit with little blue stem in my, in my front yard meadow where it's starting to come up in, in, a, in my lawn areas, not so much for my neighbors. I haven't seen it in my neighbor's lawn yet because they just mow religiously and I'm sure they're putting in all kinds of pre-emergence. So little blue stem doesn't have much of a chance and they water too much. So little blue stem doesn't like that. Um, I, yeah, just do the research, learn about your plants, learn how they spread. Do they spread by seed? Do they spread by rhizome? How easy are those seeds going to, how easily are the seeds going to germinate? Some seeds don't need any period of winter cold or wet. 
um, to germinate. Uh, they, they just need sunlight and they, they, they can get going. Some are heavy and just drop right down underneath the plant. Some blow a long distance. So these are all factors to consider. It does get complex, but man, when you're learning about it, you just, you're just so empowered and you just get hooked. You know, it's like potato chips, something like that. Plus, I guess the more the game is blowing, if it does blow or whatever, you won't know it ain't like it's blowing it. Yeah, if your neighbor keeps mowing, yeah, they're just mowing it down. They're never going to know that it's there. Yeah. Any more online questions? We have one more online. Um, so aside from the slope in your yard that you mentioned, um, did you build any berms or small hills, or is your backyard mostly flat? Yeah, well, it's not mostly. It's Well, it's mostly flat near the house. Um, obviously, it was a new house when we moved in 10 years ago, and the tractors had Nice, nicely, you know, taking away the topsoil, compacted the clay. I didn't really do anything to that clay soil. There's probably, it's a very gradual slope in the back, just a couple percent that comes down to about the middle of the yard. And at first I had lots of standing water in the middle of the yard until the plants started to do their rooting and get that water filtered down. Um, so I didn't do anything. I didn't do berms or anything like that. I just, I just, I did soil tests. I looked at the soil. I touched the soil. I saw what happened to water when it rained and match the plants to each one of the locations in the landscape. And that's, I think that's a really effective way to start out doing it and just watch what happens. Sometimes the plant isn't going to work there and it dies and that's okay. doesn't mean you're a failure. Um, just means you're learning and that's good. Awesome. Okay. Any more in-person ones? We are done here. We're done. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Been a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Yeah, definitely deep thinking. So. <laughs> um, and the video will be posted online in about one to two weeks. So if you, if anybody wants to look at the pictures again or re-listen to um, the presentation, it'll be up on www.cccneb.edu/slcs. Um, all of our past presentations are up there. Um, and then our next presentation is December 7th, and it's hosted by the Jocelyn Institute for Sustainable Communities and Cecil Stewart um, will be presenting. So we look forward to seeing everybody there. Uh, so thank you, uh, UNL uh, Environmental Program. And, and thank you, Benjamin, for that great presentation. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.